بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته ما شاء الله جزاك الله خير تسيدي مدثر um, he didn't make any mistakes uh, I'd like to welcome you all and say thank you to everyone who attended, mashallah, it's, it's good and it's beautiful like Sheikh Yasin said that we've come. I'd also like to acknowledge that the sisters are here as well and you know, we, we feel your presence. Like Sidi Imran says, we can't see you but we know you're there. Uh, this is a very, very important topic and it's something which we'll listen to today, we'll hear about it today and tomorrow the day after, week after, what is our state going to be? You know, how are we going to feel? How much of this are we going to implement? Are we really going to change ourselves? Like Sheikh Yassin said, we have to change ourselves for this, for child rearing and bringing up children to occur. It doesn't occur by just doing something with the child. It's self-rectification, which produces upbringing of a child. This is the primary source. And I want to do something with you today to teach you all a lesson. I haven't seen my children for over 16 months now. And I believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing me. But when I think of the Syrian people who have been separated from their children, I can empathize with them to some extent. But my test is nothing compared to theirs. So I find solace and I look at them and I think Alhamdulillah for what I've got. My children are healthy and fine and I long to see them. And this is a very important thing because when you leave your homes in the morning, what is the thing you're waiting for when you come home? The parents amongst you. It's to see your children, right? You go home, you go away for the weekend. When, the first, when you get home, what's the first thing you want to see or do is to hug your child, to pick up your child. For the working mothers, may Allah help them. When they go to work and they come back, what's the first thing they want to do when they get home? Is to be with their children. Now let me put it the other way around. What, what do you think your children are waiting for? When you leave home in the morning as a father, they're waiting for the door to open and daddy to come home. They hurt, they feel this. There's a pain when you're separated from those whom you love. So we need to understand that there's a massive bond between parents and children. And there's something I need to explain to you that will hopefully, hopefully enable you to not just remember, not just listen to today's talk but also carry this on in your lives. What we need is to have a paradigm change. When you change your paradigm, what does that mean? What I've just said to you, what you've just heard from Sheikh Yasin and Mulana Wajid, how has it made you feel? The mercy of the Prophet wasallam, the efforts we need to make, the bond between father and mother and child. How has it made you feel in this gathering, parents especially? It's changed you, hasn't it? You've changed you in your thought process. You, you've got this sort of intention to go home and do something. Even those who are without children, they, they have, you know, this is what I will do, inshallah. You've all made an intention. You're all taking something to take home and act upon. But what happens after a while, it goes away. And I'll give you an example of a paradigm change to make it more vivid. A man was once sitting on the bus and he writes this about himself. And another man came along with children, with children. And it's a true story about himself. And he sat on the bus quietly to one side and the children started messing around the bus. You know, throwing things and making noise and disturbing people and the father was just quiet, and, you know, just looking straight on, not being too, taking notice. And he mentioned, you know, to them be quiet, but he wasn't really doing anything. He was like passive, more or less. And this man said, I finally decided to go and talk to him, you know, say to him, look, your children are causing a bit of a, a you know, commotion on this bus, and please could you do something? So he said, I went over to him. And I said, you know, this is the case. Could you do something? And he says, oh, I didn't notice. It's, we've just come from the hospital where my wife just passed away, like the mother of the children. 
And I didn't notice this is what they were doing. And the man who's narrating the story says, my whole vision of this man changed. My whole paradigm changed. Dimension, the way I looked at things in life for this man, totally changed. I didn't want to be harsh on him anymore. I didn't want to say bad things or tell him about his children anymore. I all of, all of a sudden started to say, how are you? Are you okay? Do you need anything? It's a sad loss. I'm sorry for your loss. And this is how he changed. This was a paradigm change. So from today's talk, there's going to be a paradigm change in each and every one of us. But this change needs to last. It can't be temporary. You need to go into the change of Islam. You need to do this with everything in Islam, not just bringing up our children, but everything needs to be our paradigm, the way we look at things and the way we see things should be from the lens of Islam. This is how we should do things. So the information you're taking today, the lessons we're learning today, are not just for today's talk, are not just to feel this way today. They're to take home and implement and to live like this, to act upon what you have learned today in every step. When, when you're with your children, every moment is precious. Every moment is precious. So this is what I want everybody to understand about today's gathering. It's not just for today or for tonight or for a week. This is knowledge and learning for the rest of your lives. And I hope you got the message of what I'm trying to say here. Um, to go into some of what I want to say today, I want to start off with an incident that occurred between me and uh, Sheikh Muhammad Ali Aqubi in Syria whilst I was there. Um, my first son was born and those of you who are parents will know what do I do? Oh, is there a big responsibility? I need to read books, I need to find out, I need to come to these gatherings and learn what's to be said and you know, uh, what did the Prophet Sallallahu do with children and what is the teachings of Islam and you know, it's a big responsibility. You feel this big burden on your shoulders, you know. Dr. Junaid will, will tell you that, he's recently had a child, mashallah. It is a big burden and a big responsibility that every parent feels when they have a child, especially the first child. I see the Naveed will tell you as well, mashallah. And I went to the Sheikh, and it was after an evening, we were on the Sheikh, we were with, with the Sheikh in a, in a restaurant, we had a meal, and after the meal I approached the Sheikh, I said, Sayyidi, I've got a little uh, request, a little question. So the Sayyidina Sheikh, he said, Bismillah. So I said, you know, are there any books, are there, is there any reading material that I can read, so, you know, to help me uh, understand tarbiyah, you know, child reading, or bringing children. What can I do in this regard? And, you know, I want to, you know, I've, I've had a child and, you know, etc. And I remember the Sheikh's, the Sheikh's face, there's a big smile on the Sheikh's face. And really, mashallah, really warm smile on the Sheikh's face. As you all know, mashallah. And the Sheikh just replied, the Sheikh said, Wasim, this is not something you can take from books. This is not something you take from books. This is taken from the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The righteous people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who have spent time, with those who have spent time all the way back to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is taken from those who are with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in their thoughts, who have learnt the way of Islam by action, not just by books. This is where you get it from. So don't, and the Shaykh was trying to teach me a lesson, don't rely on books. Don't rely on a book and think a book can teach you about your children. It takes real experience. So my advice to every single parent is, Consult other parents, you know, have a group of, you know, parents coming together and discussing things. This is a very big and important way of gaining new ideas, new strategies and helping you to bring up your child. You know, it's not, books are good and I read a lot of books, alhamdulillah, especially the ones that Imran lends me. Um, and they are good and I've mentioned a few things from books today, but it's real life experiences that we're sharing with you that you can see are affecting you. Like Sheikh Yassin said, the real life experiences are the best things for yourselves and for us, for everybody. It's real life that matters. We've gone into this um, cyber world of, you know, I don't know what to call it. It's not real, it's artificial, it's, it's very trivial, it's not real anymore. You need to get back to real life and talk to people and interact with others and ask them for advice. The elders should be consulted all the time. You know, I mean, personally, from my own experience, we were in Syria together, you know, me and my wife, alone absolutely alone. I remember the day my son was born, it was the, one of the most worrying days of my life because I was sitting and I didn't know what was going on inside and the thoughts went through my head, I could lose my wife and my child today. This could happen, so could happen. There was a beautiful sister from Birmingham there, may Allah be blessed her, she was the one that came and helped us and did a lot for us, may Allah reward her. Um, but I remember how much I was concerned 
and we had nobody there. So what my wife would do, she'd get on the phone and phone her mother in Pakistan. What do I do when this happens? What do I do when this happens? She's getting advice from mother in Pakistan. But this is what we need. You need to, to get the advice of elders on how to bring up your children and how to do things for them. And Alhamdulillah, you know, Allah, I really felt the, the, the inayah, the care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we were out there. Because I thought to myself, we were alone. Anything could have happened. You know, anything could have happened, but subhanAllah, look how Allah looked after us. The day that we went to the hospital, we were actually in a lesson with Shaykh Muhammad Ali Al-Qubi. And I said to my wife on the day, you know, let's go together because, you know, I, I, we should get the barakah of being in the lesson. And we were in the maqam of Shaykh Al-Akbar Muhyiddin Al-Arabi, rahimahullah ta'ala. So we went there, we went to the lesson, and that evening everything happened. You know, so we got the blessings and it went, it went smoothly. You know, we actually, sorry, that evening we found the doctor and we said we just go for a checkup. We went for the checkup and... He said, go to the hospital. We went to the hospital, they said, you know, it's all going to happen. So it was actually, we, you know, if we hadn't gone and etc., it would have been difficult and we don't know what to do. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I could feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was looking after us there. We were alone, but we weren't alone. We were with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something we need to remember that we can learn as much as we can, we can take as much advice as we can, but ultimately we must rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything. This is one of the things I'm sure that the dua becomes sincere when you have children. Oh Allah, help me to raise my child. Oh Allah, help me to guide my child, teach him Islam, teach him luf or and her luf for the Prophet wasallam. Right, Sayyidina Reed, this is something which you do. You, you feel the sincerity in your dua just because of your child. Right? This is something which we need to remember, turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all our affairs, but especially for your children, because the dua of the father, the mother for the child is accepted. It's one of the du'as which is accepted. Because you do it with sincerity. You do it with real servitude and neediness and this poverty. And, and all, you know, such a deep and, you know, intense need and feeling of need to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you do du'a for your child. You know, the parents know that. And you should, do, and this is an important du'a. So always rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to your children. Before I mention a few things about children themselves, I just want to mention one more thing, important principles I'm giving you here. And this is loving children. Loving our children. We all love our children indeed. But there's two types of love. There are two types of mahabba, of love. There is a mahabba which we call tabi'iyya or natural, which we're disposed, which we all have for young, even for, I mean, we have for young children, for whether it be our children or somebody else's children, you want to look after them, you want to, we love young children, it's natural in every human being to show kindness and compassion and love to their children. This is a natural thing, to love their parents, to love their spouses, it's family, etc. It's natural love. Yeah, it's in the hearts, it's, it's how human beings were created. There's a second type of love, and this is called al-mahabba al sharia Love according to the Sharia, love according to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Love according to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll give you an example to make it more clearer to you. We love our children because they are our children and we don't want them to be overburdened, we don't want them to be harmed. So you know what we do? We give them extra sleep, we give them, you know, let them relax and have more food and give them extra, you know, a bit of fizzy drink that they shouldn't be having. Because we, you know, we, we, we love our children, we want to give them what they like. You know, we buy them presents, like Shaykh Yassin was saying, that all these presents, because that's what they like. So our compassion and love for them makes us do things for them, right? This is our love of, na the, the natural love we have for them. However, the love of Sharia, or the love by Sharia, dictates to us that we should buy the masalla, like Shaykh Yassin said. Because we love them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we want to make them into servants of Ar-Rahman, we should buy the musalla for them. Because we love them, we should wake them up for Fajr, when they come to the age of waking up. Because we want to make them servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We love them for the sake of Allah. We love them because Allah loves them and wants them to be his servants. What, do, what should we do? Wake them up for Fajr. We love them, so we give them education, dunya education, what, what types of education. But we love them for the sake of Allah, that's why we want them to learn the Quran, to learn the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the problem comes when we give predominance and we prefer the love of our, that we're dis disposed to, we put that above the love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we do things to our children or for our children, that's to their detriment. 
And we think we're doing the right thing, right? Because you're doing it out of love. You're doing it because you think it's good for them. You're being kind and merciful to your children. But in the long run, not making them pray is going to result in them not wanting to pray later on. It becomes a chore, like Sheikh Yassin said. It becomes difficult. Or if you had had love for them for the sake of Allah, you would have made sure they prayed on time at the age of seven. And they got into the routine, and then they became steadfast on their prayers. You love your children, and they like to dress up, and you like to dress your daughters up. So you don't make them wear the hijab when they're seven, when they're eight, when they're nine. You think, you know, when they're balik, when they're responsible, and they're required to wear the hijab, we'll, we'll tell them to wear the hijab. And at the age of 12, 13, 14 comes, and they don't want to wear the hijab. Right? You think, you know, well, you know, okay, they wear the hijab, and they go out to school, and it comes off. You know, my brother told me, because he took his daughter to school, and he didn't want to take her to secondary school. It was Y7 y in secondary school, right? I forget about these things. Um, and he took her for the open day in the first day of school. And he was worried. He didn't want to take her to that school. He was actually planning to take them to Islamic school, private school. But he thought, let's go for the first day, see what it's like. You know? And, and he, he was going to leave her there. So he was there with her for the first sort of 10, 15 minutes. And you know, parents were dropping their children off. And she was the only one with hijab on. She was the only one with hijab on. And he left her there, and he went out. And he said, as I went out, I regretted it. I thought, you know, am I really doing the right thing, leaving her here alone? She's the first time that, you know, she's in a secondary school. There's all people older than her. Is, is it going to be or a kifa? So he thought, I'll go back in and just have a little, keep an eye on her for a few minutes, see if she's settling in, how she's getting on. And, you know, then I might leave her here. And, I went, and he said, I went back, and where was the hijab? It was halfway up her head. Half her hair was exposed in front of all the girls. And then I, the brother said, I thought to myself, it's not her fault. It's not her fault, it's my fault. What do I expect when I leave her as the only girl who's got hijab on amongst numerous Muslim girls that don't have hijab on? What do I expect? And he said, I took her out and I didn't send her to the school. And he sends her now to private school. Right? What are we doing to our children? Are we nurturing them and giving them the Islamic ethics and teachings? Or are we neglecting them? And neglect is haram. It's the biggest sin that we're doing to our children. We're neglecting them. In the next or last 10 minutes, I want to just talk or mention a little bit mentioned by Imam al-Ghazali. And I recommend everybody to go to this piece of information this, of Imam al-Ghazali. It's from his famous book, Ihya al din In Ihya al din Imam al-Ghazali, in the book on disciplining the soul and on breaking the two desires, which is one of the 40 books in the Hiyal Umuddin, Imam Ghazali talks about child rearing or bringing up children, tarbiya. And it's a lot of advice, which I can't go through today in detail with the lack of time. Sheikh Yasin touched upon some of these things. Um, I'm going to read some of these things, and they speak for themselves, so I won't give too much explanation, but I just want to share this so you go back and you read the whole section yourselves. It's available in the Hiya al It's a book we should all have. Imam Ghazali is Hujjatul Islam, the proof of Islam. One of the greatest scholars of Islamic history. He doesn't require being you know, uh, introduced to people. He should be known. He is, a, he is a great master of many of the sciences. And his book, the Hiya al is one of the greatest books uh, that we've had in Islam. He says, and to quote the Imam in the translation, Know that the way in which young children are disciplined is one of the most important of all matters. A child is a trust in the care of his parents, for his pure heart is a precious, uncut jewel, devoid of any form or carving, which will accept being cut into any shape and will be disposed according to the guidance it receives from others. If it is habituated to and instructed in goodness, then this will be its practice when it grows up, and it will attain to felicity in this world and the next its parents too, and all its teachers which share in it, will share in its reward. Similarly, should it be habituated to evil and neglected as though it were an animal, then misery and perdition will be its lot, and the responsibility for this will be borne by its guardian and supervisor. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, ward off from yourselves and your families a fire whose fuel is humans and stones. A father may strive to protect his son from fire in this world, but yet it is of far greater urgency that he protect him from the fires which exist in the afterlife. 
This should be, this he should do by giving him dis discipline, teaching him and refining his character, and preserving him from bad company, and by not allowing him to acquire the custom of self-indulgence, or to love finery and luxury, in the quest for which he might well squander his life, and when older, perish, uh, perish forever. Right, this is what we do when we neglect them. This is what we do when we don't nurture them. It leads to their destruction. And the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith that a father, that a parent has not given his child anything better than good adab, than good manners. A father, a parent has never given his child anything better than good manners. So this is something which we must inculcate in our children. To skip a few pages, and talking about dealing with the child in terms of food, in terms of clothing, he says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he should be protected from children who are accustomed to luxury and comfort, and to wearing expensive garments, and from mixing with all who would speak to him of such things, and thereby make them seem fine in his eyes. Right, that sentence to me just reminds me of fashion and brands, right? I'll repeat it for you. He should be protected from children who are accustomed to luxury and comfort and to wearing expensive garments and from mixing with all who would speak to him of such things and thereby make them seem fine in his eyes. I didn't know about brands when I was younger. Where did we all learn about brands? About logos, about, you know, fashion. At school, your friends mention the name of a person, right? It's all these names, all these companies and the names of people. You know them, I don't want to mention any particular one. You learned these at school and you started wearing clothes with the name of somebody on it, right? Why did you do that? Because somebody influenced you. People around you were influencing you to have that. That's cool. That's good. And it seemed good in your eyes. Imam Ghazali almost a thousand years ago told us about this and warned us about this. A thousand years ago, rahimahullah, may Allah be pleased with him. This is why I want you to go back to this whole section and read it Because there's so much relevant things I'm speaking out a few things We need to avoid TV We need to avoid schools that will de you know, Where children are all about fashion And it's difficult because where do you send your child? What school do you send him to or her to? Where all the people are geared up to learn about fashion And the latest trend on the internet The latest you know, YouTube video or the latest you know, I've discovered now they all look, like to watch fighting, you know, these little 10 minute fights or, you know, 10, you know, two minute fights on the YouTube videos and there's like um, Facebook pages dedicated to giving you all these fights and knockouts and all this is ridiculous, right? Where did they get that from? Because it's cool at school, because this is the, you know, this is the buzz at school. And you, we don't, parents don't know about this, right? Why does every child want a mobile phone? Maybe it's because, like Sheikh Yassi said, you know, the parents are on the phones. But in reality, they want a particular brand of phone because of the, of the school and, and the people they mix with. If you give them one of those brick Nokias from 10, 10 years ago, they just throw it back in your face. Why do they want, you know, a cool phone? Because their friends have got smartphones and, you know, everything, right? So what are we doing when we send them out of their homes, out of our homes? You know, we are just giving them to the dunya. And whatever's out there is just throwing them left, right and centre and we don't know. And when they come home and they don't listen to us and they're busy in their rooms doing their things and they want to go out with their mates and this and that, then we start complaining. Then we say, oh, you know, come to the Imam, the Mawlana, what's that? Oh, he doesn't listen to me. And he doesn't listen to me. Please have a word with him. You're the Imam, you should have... You know, trust me, you're, you have the most influence on your child. And like Sheikh Yassin said, if you lose that, somebody else takes it. And it's not going to be the Mulana in the masjid. It's not going to be the Imam of the masjid. It's not going to be a sheikh. It's not going to be one of his teachers. It's going to be his friends. It's going to be the white tens and elevens that take over. They're the ones he looks up to. And you all know this because you've been through it. Or well, most of you have. Some of you are going through it now. This is what happens. You look up to the elders. When you come out of school, you look up to the elders that were in school with you or at college, at uni. You know, you, this is how you feel towards people. You don't think about your father and mother anymore. Because you, your father and mother have given you over to society. This is neglect. We need to not give our children to schools. And I let you know, schooling was invented in the 19th century. Was invented in the 19th century. And children were taken to school under armed command. Under, you know, people who didn't want to send their children to school. It was invented. 
came from Germany, he was taken to America. And people didn't want to send their children to school. What happened? They brought the army in. And the army says, if you don't send your children, this is what's going to happen. And they, they were forcefully sent, forced schooling. And that has now become the norm, right? People think you have to send your child to school. No, you don't. The law doesn't say you have to. The law says you have to educate your children. And you should all look into this. How do you educate your children? And what does the law say about this? There's many homeschooling projects out there. There's many private schools. It's an investment, but it's the biggest, it's the best investment. Like Sheikh Yassim was saying, you can give millions of pounds. It won't make a difference. You have to invest in your children by looking after them, giving them the right environment to work in. And it has to be done together as a community. It can't, it can't be done, it can't be done by yourselves. You need to come together and do it, inshallah. This is very, very important. I'll finish with that, but I'll, I'll reiterate that you go to this section of Imam al-Ghazali in the Ihya al-Madin. It's a very famous section. The actual book, Disciplining the Soul and Breaking the Two Desires, is a separate published book. You can buy it separately if you want. If you go to the Ihya al-Madin, you go to this book on disciplining the soul and breaking the two desires, then you can look in this section. This is in part of that. And it's a very good book for yourselves. You know, I'm talking about self-rectification. That's also in this chapter. So it's a very, very important book. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to maintain this knowledge and take it home and act upon it. And ask, 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 ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you all, to bless your children and protect them and protect us all and allow us to act and live Islam. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi jma'in. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen.